Good morning, everybody. My name is David Rothstein. Uh, I'm a band leader here in Chicago. I have a music company, uh, David Rothstein Music. And welcome to the unplanned uh, Facebook page. And uh, we are really thrilled to have on our Ask the Experts uh, uh, seminar, webinar that we are doing now, uh, a person that I've admired for many, many years, have benefited from all her or in, her insights and talents and uh, her books and, and videos. And you may have seen her on a lot of different programs at CNN, on um, Oprah Winfrey, Rachel Ray, Good Morning America, and lots of other tremendous national resources. But she's a real treasure and has certainly made the world that is falling apart, giving them some tools to be able to find their way back. So uh, it's really great to have you here. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, it's delightful to be here with you, David. So um, this is a, certainly a very interesting time, something that no one, unless they were living in the uh, 1918, has experienced this level of chaos. And it's um, equally as, as tricky for people that, um, that now that we live with so many distractions in our regular life, with phones and social media and emails, you know, people are feeling very overwhelmed and uh, it is, it is. I'm sure that you are, uh, you are busy as ever in terms of um, uh, your your amount of work because people are changing their entire lives are now upside down. So maybe we can start to work on some ways of giving some people some tools and talk about uh, uh, some ways of getting their uh, personal life as well as their their company is kind of back on track and now everything's kind of combined all together. So maybe you could talk a little bit, Julie, about uh, what a lot of the things you're hearing and some of the basic advice you're giving to people these days. Yeah, sure. So yeah, you, I think you hit the nail on the head, like world turned upside down and any routine that we had before, it just, you know, tossed, right? And any routines that we didn't have <laughs> before, also kind of now there's an opportunity to create a new thing. Um, so I think for better or for worse, we all have to recognize that whatever systems we had going into this, I haven't spoken to a single person who hasn't said, you know, there were, it wasn't perfect before. I might not have been pushing myself as hard as I could or innovating enough in my business. I, you know, wasn't taking good care of myself right? Like the work-life balance. People had issues coming in. Now everything's sort of scrambled. And I think that if we work th through organization, there's no question, like in times of chaos, organization can be very grounding, very centering, very calming, and actually help us be better at both the personal life and even in our changing businesses. And I know the wedding industry is really uh, being challenged right now is one of the industries that's having a difficult time. It is, it is a challenge on a lot of different levels. I mean, first of all, you know, I had a WeWork office downtown and yeah. now I'm working out of my home in Evans. There is aspects of uh, physically, you know, being in a work slash home environment. So now a lot of people that are working maybe at home now, um, especially people in, in you know, the wedding industry that maybe had offices and, and now they're dealing with people canceling, people rescheduling, yeah. restructuring their businesses. How can they keep their employees going? How do they keep that all organized? Yeah. So um, maybe you can talk and we're going to get into a lot of different, different aspects of organizing and stuff, but yeah. the home office I think has become a, um, a unique situation for a lot of people yeah. and for a lot of people that, I see photographs of them they're purging, you know, and going through all these things that they have in their house and then yeah. trying to squeeze their office into that. So for yeah. someone setting up a home office now, what would be some of your, uh, some of your best tips? Yeah. So the first principle of a, a successful home office and successful is you can focus, you enjoy being there. It's energizing. You're able to get things done. The first need is you must have a designated space and it really needs to be adequate for the kind of work you do. So in wedding planning, whether you're a photographer or you're, you know, you do design work or music, it's more than just a work surface. You probably need an adequate work surface to spread things out. 
You probably need storage for resource materials that you pull upon, whether those are files or books or an idea board. You need to make sure it's a designated space that is not really a dual function space. And that's very hard to do because your home was not designed to house your home office. And even if you work from home, sometimes it was probably for short bursts of time rather than this is now base camp. So you have to get really creative and rethink. Is there a spare room that can be converted? If there is not a spare room and you need to, for example, take over your dining room as your home office, is it going to be dual function where you're going to be working during the day and eating on that at night? Or are you really going to like permanently reconfigure and say, we now eat in the kitchen. That's fine. And I'm going to, the dining room is now my true home office. If you have to do dual function, like I live in New York city, you're in Chicago. I'm sure you have people from all over um, that are in the city and in bigger homes out in the suburbs. But if you need to share a space, like dining room table is home office by day and it's family dining at night, you need to have containers and bins that you can set up your office in the morning in five minutes and you can close it down and tuck it away in five minutes, not 30 minutes. It's got to be like, like the old speakeasies, you know, like oh, the coppers are coming, flip the switch. <laughs> so that's an organizational, um, it's simple, you know, you just need like bins and boxes and it's like, here's where all my pens and pencils go. Here's my box of files of what I'm working on and have some kind of closed storage, like a, a credenza. Take out the old, you know, formal dining ware that you never use, except maybe in Thanksgiving and clear out a couple shelves for your office supplies, that sort of thing. And, you know, I read your book a, lo a long time ago, uh, Organizing from the Inside Out. Yeah, because what I was doing, I was doing it from the opposite way where I'd be like, and everybody's done this. And I see people on Facebook doing this, even just this morning. I'm going to get organized. This is it. I can't live this. You know, and then you what do you do? You don't really do anything inside the house. You get in your car, you got your wallet or your credit card, you hop over to container store and you're like, wow, look at this thing. I guess I could, you know, alphabetize my cereal boxes and I can get this giant container. And, and then you come home with all these things. And you don't know, instead of realizing how you actually internally operate and what's realistic, then going, That's you know, right. I, I think we get in these, uh, we don't want to deal with all the measuring and analyzing. We just want to, we're on this emotional high of I'm going to fix my life and I'm going to go to the container store and buy all these things. And yeah. that's really the wrong way to do it. Maybe you can talk about, you know, that method and, yeah. and how to put that together the right way. Yeah, so organizing from the outside in is kind of shoot first, ask questions later. Right. And it's usually what we do when we're avoiding and procrastinating on getting organized or we don't know where to start and we put it off and we put it off and we put it off and then you hit a breaking point in the middle of the night or just as about you're about to start your work day and you're like, okay, now's the moment. If you find yourself trying to get organized in that reactive uh, impulse, you probably should stop. Don't do it in that moment because you haven't planned it out. You don't know where you're going. It's completely reactive. You're going to make a bigger mess than when you started and you're going to quit before you're done. And then you're going to be like, oh my God, organizing doesn't work. No, it works if you think and plan before you ask questions before you attack. And it's very simple, really. And it doesn't take that long to do the planning. You just need to know how to do it. And that's kind of liberating. Because people are like, oh my God, I don't want to plan. I just want to do it. It takes literally like an hour to an hour and a half to think through your system before you try to design it. So I teach a, a three-step process. It's analyze, strategize, attack. And for your space, and let's say it's your home office, you start out, you just ask yourself a series of questions. They're all in the book, organizing from the inside out, but they're pretty simple. You ask, what is working about this space? What works about it? Because why, why fix it if it's not broken, right? 
then what's not working? I can never find this. There's no room for that. I'm always looking for such and such. Like, I'm, you know, there's too much noise around me. People interrupt me all the time. It's like too interruption rich. So what doesn't work? Um, another question you ask is like, why do I want to get organized? And this is so important, David. I, I actually think this is almost the, the secret fuel to success when it comes to organizing. People can break through and learn how to organize and design a system if they identify what's on the other side of the clutter. Why do you want to get organized? What are you going to be able to do that you cannot do now? And for most people, it, it has something to do with saving time that they waste looking for things or procrastinating on doing stuff because they are afraid they're not going to be able to find what they need to do it, right? So you're saving time, you're saving money or making money. So it has to do with time, money, and stress. Because stress, when we're operating in a stressful environment, it also steals time and focus, right? If you feel stressed, how much of your work day are you actually getting anything done? Maybe for you know 20% of the day you're effective and 80% of the day you're just sort of going in circles. So define what you wanna get out of it and that will, and you write that down and that actually lifts your whole, um, the whole intention to a higher level. And then when you go to organize and you hit the difficult spots, you're like, why did I want to get organized in the first place? This is hard. I don't want to make these decisions anymore. I want to go out and play in the backyard. So why do I want to get organized? Oh, that's why. Because I think I can stabilize my business. I could keep all my employees. I could have a better well-being. I could get fit. I will feel healthier. I'll feel more creative. So if you name the goal, it will really help you through the whole process. That makes a lot of sense because I think we get into the technical aspects of it and we forget the why, you know, we yeah. get into the what. And then the once you get into the why, then you can really have something much bigger behind you than just I have to, you know, because if you're getting into the why, then you've got much more deeper motivation to do stuff yeah. um, because certainly anybody can appear to be organized, you know, and then all of a sudden you open up this, this uh, junk drawer or this closet and, you know, like when you're a little kid and you've got people coming over and it's like, oh my God, and you take all these piles of clothes and everything and yeah. just open up that door and like it seems organized, but that's really not going to make your life any easier. It just procrastinates it basically. Right. You can't, that doesn't help you function, right? Like we organize in order to function better in any right. one of our goals, our fitness goals, our family goals, uh, our business goals. It's to function. We, we get organized so that we can function more effectively and reach our goals more efficiently with less barriers, right? So yes. yeah, you name the why. And not only will it be this, the, the fuel of motivation to keep going when the going gets tough, and it will get tough at certain points. It's like annoying to get organized. It takes time. You have to make decisions. It's, and it's, people get decision fatigue when they're organizing. They just get tired of making decisions. Do I keep this? Do I don't keep this? What do I label this? So that why will get you over those humps. Um, and it also can help you design your system. It gives, you know, cause now, you know, what does my system need to do for me? Right. Absolutely. And also I think part of it is just being honest, honest with yourself about how you actually operate, not how you ideally operate, because if you organize things based on this ideal, you know, uh, Brady bunch kind of format, you don't work that way, especially, you know, if you're not 22 years old, you've got a lot of practice being the way you are. And so if you can just be honest with yourself, like, look, I always drop my keys here. I have a hook over there, but I don't put it there. So put, just put a little dish or something where you naturally, right? Isn't that a better way to? Exactly. That's exactly right. Look to where the piles are and create storage right there. And it, it, it requires really taking a lot of judgment away. Like we self judge, like I should do it this way, or I should do it like that magazine cover or no, it's uh, to me, organizing from the inside out is really about designing a system based on your, your, your unique personality, your way of thinking, and what you're trying to achieve. 
And that's the beauty of being a human is that we're all a little different. We all have this unique way of thinking. That's what makes you a great musician or band leader, right? Mm -hmm. That's what makes this person a great photographer. There's a lot of photographers, but you're the only photographer like you. And so if you design your system around the unique way you think and your natural yes. habits, it's very easy to maintain because it feels organic and it celebrates who you are. It brings out your best. I'll tell you, I like seven years ago, I, I, I met the love of my life, late, late in life love. And he had a sailboat and um which i'd never been on and by the way hashtag sailboats aren't really that fun you're just working on the sailboat the whole time this is not a leisure craft but i went on this boat and it was looked like a bachelor like there were like beer cans it was a mess it, he was so disorganized and i asked him some questions and he allowed me to ask some questions and i just got everything in order the way he thinks and he was astonished because people had tried to organize him in the past and he, he always said people would hide his stuff from him, right? And when he, but when you're on a sailboat, you don't have a lot of uh, room for error when you're reaching for a tool or something. And we just organized it in a way that was so organic to him. He, he was able to, it was, it was from the inside out. He'd never even thought to do that, nor had anybody else. And it took very little time and he was able to sustain it himself because it worked the way he thought. And, and I think a lot of people uh, have that same kind of analogy for their personal homes or people that they live with, you know? Yeah. And I think the ability to kind of, instead of force a square peg into a round hole, we have yeah. to be like, okay, this is the way uh, this person is. And rather than, you know, it just kind of like when you're sailing, you know, you can't change the waters, you can change the sail. And yeah. so that's basically what you, you figured out, like what his, um, what he, what he is and what he's about, and then just kind of adjusted things to that. And then yeah. it fits because otherwise, you know, trying to get this pair of jeans on, I don't care how hard I try with the shirt or whatever, it's, it's yeah. just not going to fit. And the, the quicker you get to that, the more you can get back to the stuff that you love. You yeah. can concentrate hanging out on the boat and just relaxing, having a beer and being being yourself. Um, and to me, that's the benefit, especially for our businesses in the, in the uh, wedding industry is like, we want to get to the work. We don't yeah. want to like spend time, as, as you said, like looking for this paper, getting, you know, trying to find a light bulb, trying to, you know, to get all that stuff out of the way yeah. so that we can be the best versions of ourselves. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, a complete Nick, uh, you know, completely uptight and a personality. No, There's ways of st staying who you are, but making it in the most realistic way of, of yeah. like getting rid of, and, and just staying organized that way. And a big part of right now, what I see a lot of people doing is purging. Yeah. And you have mentioned that briefly before the importance of, um, you know, and they have these hoarder shows, which are of course extremes versions of that. But, um, you know, we have so much stuff and certainly, you know, our parents and, and grandparents, I mean, the stuff that they held on to is maybe much more than we have in the digital sense. Yeah. Uh, we don't have boxes and boxes of videotapes and all kinds of stuff like that, but we still have a lot of things. And I think those things after a while can really kind of take over your life when you're yeah. surrounded by all this chaos. It's hard to think clearly. So I mean, what are some of the best steps to kind of get started with purging. So purging, interestingly, again, is not just like containerizing, like going shopping for containers is not the way to start your organizing project. Throwing things out is not the way to start your organizing project either. So getting rid of things is not designing a system. Getting rid of things is just getting rid of this particular period of time's accumulation. And as soon as you get rid of stuff, it just keeps coming back in. So I really think you always want to organize before you purge. And so I have this formula. So I was telling you there's three steps, right? You analyze, then you strategize. And we kind of skip that. We can come back to that, this kindergarten model. But you want to think about your office, for example, into zones 
What are the zones of your space? Think of it like a kindergarten classroom as a model for organizing anything. Just picture a kindergarten classroom in your head. Mm -hmm. You walk in, you're five years old or you're 45 years old, it doesn't matter. You're like, there's a reading corner, there's an arts and crafts area, there's a building block zone, there's a little snack zone. You can see the room is divided into these activity zones and within, which represent everything that there is to do. And then everything is stored at its point of use. So there's only one place to find anything or put it away. You find a tambourine in the middle of the floor, you know exactly where it goes. Of course it goes into the music zone. A f every five-year-old can figure that out after the first week of school, hmm. right? So think about your office also, or any room in your house. What are the activities that take place in my space? I do selling, I, you know, I'm doing reach outs to people and I'm doing sort of the promotion, I'm doing the actual work, I'm doing, you know, what are the activities that you do in, in running your business? Do you do thinking and research? Do you do creative work? So name, uh, I really think three to five zones is the maximum for any space. It's not 10 zones, it's three to five. Keep it simple. And then you kind of, create activity zones in your space so that everything's stored, grouped, and very it's natural. There's only one place to find or put something away. So that's the, the thinking. And then once you do that, and you have the kindergarten zones in your head, then you can start to sort and purge your items. But first you have to group them into the categories so you put like with like. And then once you have things accumulated, it's much easier to decide, oh gosh, I don't need the old version. I have a current version. I don't need, you know, six of these. I only need two of these. So if you group things, sort and group things before you purge, the purging is much easier than if you just start purging. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah, that makes total sense. Because then you've got the right mindset too. And there's also... Um, I think clothes for a lot of people is, is definitely one of the biggest, most challenging things. And for a lot of times for women with shoes and stuff, and yeah. when's the last time you wore this? I mean, the, uh, the I like the, the kiss system, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So yeah. I, I think works well with what you were talking about. And then the 80, 20 rule too. Like when's the last time you actually wore that outfit? Well, I mean, who knows? Maybe I would get invited to this gala where you have to wear only purple outfits. So maybe, maybe I should hold on to this just in case, you know, so I think the more, the, the freest people are the ones that um, use the stuff they have to, uh, to make their life easier. But by having all these extra stuff you have to sort through and you never wear, it's just exhausting mentally. Yeah. And it, it makes it harder to find the things that you really do want. So, Maybe you can talk about clothes and how to, how to deal with something yeah. like that. Well, so. well, first of all, most people, not all people, certainly most people that I have worked with, and I, I am in that group also, have more than one size clothes in their closet. <laughs> it really goes up and down. Especially after this virus, right? Oh, yeah. my gosh, yeah. Oh, I, yes. So one of the things that clutters the closet is that you have multiple sizes in there. And one of the best things you can do for yourself is just keep your current size in your closet and take everything else out and either store it by size. If you're fairly certain you're gonna keep going up and down these two sizes, that's fine. Store it and then you just, your, your closet only holds the clothes that currently fit you and look good on you. And it may be that your closet looks really empty because there's really only five things that currently fit you and look good on you, but mm -hmm. that's okay. Isn't it nicer to just go into the closet? You're going in and taking the same five things every day anyway. Exactly. Why torture yourself by having to go past all those clothes that don't fit you right now that make you feel terrible on the right. way to five things, right? What, did, what a way to start the day man, I got to lose weight. No, just like 
it, it's very liberating to do that. So just your current size, take everything else out. You can group it by size and then you can look at it and say, if in five months or one year or two years, I lose the weight or gain the weight and I need to put this on again, would, I, would, it, still, would it still be like fashionable? <laughs> right. Because if it's not a classic, you should probably get rid of it because by the time it fits again, you're not gonna, you'd be like, this is old fashioned or this is an old trend or this isn't hip anymore. We don't wear our collars like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, That's I know. That's way to get rid of stuff. Yeah, so on to my no, next point. I'm sorry, wait, let me get myself back together. Okay, um, but uh, that, that makes a lot, lot of sense because clothes are absolutely, um, uh, we've been going to some of these uh, estate sales, these people's yeah. homes that have like lived in the same house and like on their beds, they have piles, like, like two foot tall full of clothes. Yeah. And they had some outfit from 1989, it must've been, still yeah. had the price tag on it. There yeah. was, you know, they were still hanging in. And I, th I, think, I think people have to reevaluate why it is that they're buying things. You know, is this a want or a need? And yeah. is it just a, a Band-Aid or is it, you know, I think that's, that's a part of it. That's how we get in trouble with having all this stuff to, to purge later. But also, David, what you bring up is really important because I think it's one of the reasons people hang on to stuff is they bought it and they feel bad as though mm -hmm. they've wasted money if they just get rid of it. So I really feel you have to, and this, this is a stage in our lives where we do want to declutter. We want to make space. We want to make space for working from home and you know, doing everything under one roof and enjoying our environments. So you should just ask yourself what what value does this bring to your life right now and if it's not enriching your life now you just got to forgive yourself that you spent that money and get rid of it because holding on to it does not actually make it it doesn't solve the problem you're trying to solve which is i don't want to waste this money you already wasted it keeping it in your closet with the price tag on is not actually solving the problem but if you actually i I once worked with a client where, who was like a big book buyer. Everyone will relate to this. Like a lot of us are, we love books. And uh, it was books and it was also um, like bath, like shower gels and body gel. Like there was so much stuff every time she went to a drugstore or whatever, she bought all this stuff. And we put everything out on the, dining room table that she was, she just never used. And it was a massive amount and it represented thousands of dollars. Mm. But getting it all grouped so she could see it before she got rid of it was, it like cured her of impulse buying because she was like, oh my God, I do this and it just keeps adding up. It's like thousands of dollars of impulse buying and it's just cluttering up my house. So she, looking at it all together was very powerful for her. And then she released it, forgave herself and never did it again. I think that's a powerful thing. I mean, if you can actually see it, because what happens is a little 30, $40 here and there, you know, and what a lot of people, they, they go to target to go get some toothpaste and they come home with a vacuum cleaner, you know? Exactly. And I think that's, we live in these giant big box stores that are like, Oh, as I'm here, then you're wandering, through Best Buy and you, wow, I look at those TVs. Oh my gosh, what if I could have that? And maybe the importance of keeping lists before you go out and saying, and or realizing that this is your impulse to do that and having your, you know, what would Julie uh, moment and say, what would Julie say, you know, to, uh, to- Where's this gonna go in my house? And what am I gonna get rid of to make room for this thing I'm gonna buy, right? Like that's another way to think, to keep, to control impulse buying is, recognize every single thing you buy is going to take up some space in your house. Do you feel like you have empty space in your house waiting for stuff? Probably not. So anything you buy before you buy it is like, what am I gonna get rid of to make room for that? It's a really good question. And it just makes you stop and go, first of all, do I even need it, right? And yeah, yeah it is gonna take space and it's gonna take time. Um, and in the age of now, the pandemic, Anybody who's sort of, uh, the browsing in stores is kind of, you don't get to do that anymore. You gotta get in and get out of that store. 
Yes. Which list, become a hunter shopper, not a gatherer shopper. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important to figure out what it is that the purpose, okay, going back to that why, yeah. the big picture of like the motivation for getting stuff. Yeah. Um, and now also another thing, since some of these weddings are canceled and, and people in the industry and a lot of people at home too are now um, have all this extra time on their hands, right? So now you've got, you know, from 7 a.m. till, you know, midnight or whatever, you've got this huge body of time. And you don't have, you know, unless you're doing a webinar um, or you do <coughs> something, you have a lot of extra time. So uh, what are some ways that people can kind of start to structure themselves yeah. when maybe they're now live, working at home and you've got the refrigerator behind you and you can go for a walk and TV. Yeah. What are some ways of like making it, uh, helping your business and helping your personal life? Are you totally, okay, now... Uh, I'm switching channels. Now I'm work in complete work mode. And now I'm in complete relax and watch TV type of mode. How do yes. you switch back and forth? You must, just like I said, you have to have a designated workspace. You also need designated hours. And you need, we all need, we all benefit from a structure. It's really critical to the sanity and productivity and energy to have work hours. So figure out what your work hours are. Maybe if you used to go to an office, you literally replicate that at home. But now that you don't have to commute, you reinvest the commute time into your personal life. Do not reinvest the commute time into work time. It makes no sense. I've talked to so many people who are doing that. I'm like, why would you do that? You weren't working when you were commuting. Why are you now waking up and feeling compelled that I can't have breakfast, I can't go for a walk, I can't work out, I can't pet the dog, I can't play with the kids. I just, just because I can't, it makes no sense at all. We need edges. So reinvest commute time into personal time. And then you, these are my work hours. And then within, and then, and then here's another thing. I'm gonna get to the within in a minute. You also really need a ritual to transition into work and then transition back to home, right? Mm -hmm. So get make a habit of after your morning routine, you get dressed for work and maybe you go outside for a five minute walk and then you come back into your house and you've kind of replicated your commute, but it's five minutes, but you changed your environment. Just think about how much thinking you did naturally during your commute. That's where a lot of like a lot of people are missing that when they're working from home. It's like I have no sort of wandering mind time. It's just there's no transition. So create one. Go out, take a walk, or take a bike ride, or go for a run, um, or go get the paper. Um, and then you come in, and then you go to your office, and now you're working. And you could take a lunch break if you want. Set your use your uh, smartphone to keep your structure for the day to go off. And then when you're done for the day, you need a ritual again to, to end your work day. Go change your clothes or go out, take another walk, and then come back in the door. And now I am in relax, family, decompression, self-time. You need those transition rituals. Otherwise, it just blurs together. And you can't switch your head because this is about switching your brain, right? right. I do this thing on um, set, uh, end of day on Instagram. I do these Instagram lives around between six and 6.15 every day to help everybody end their day and transition from their work day into their evening. Um, and it's really important. And I'm, one of the things that I talk about is that during our work hours, it's all about our brain power. In our evenings and weekends, it's really about our senses. So it's like, what you know what I mean? And so you change the rhythm and texture and it helps you be more productive at work. And it's tricky because, you know, now with our phones, you know, it used to be my dad would come home from work and he was at home and that was, he wouldn't talk about work or maybe, you know, some, but when you own your own company and you're, you know, you're fighting for your life in terms of your uh, the events industry, wedding industry, you know, it's hard to be able to sometimes completely like, turn off your phone and turn off all your computers and all that kinds of stuff because 
Um, I mean, even in, even in good times when things were just, you know, going along, there's always yeah. some post you could, you could be doing or some Instagram right. ping and then some other webinar or some opportunity or something like that. And it's a, you know, it's a very slippery, slippery slope because you don't want to be like missing out on opportunities, but you, like you said, you need to have, you know, um, the, the, we only appreciate light because we turn the lights off sometimes. Right. Yes. You know, and and it's hard. yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, I was just saying that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. But I think if within your work day, you create some substructure that makes sure that you're dividing your time between the various things you need to do for your business, that helps you contain the work and focus. It's that sort of working all the time and scattered yeah. approach. It just steals energy and focusing. We're not really effective. So if you, right now, I think any small business, um, and particularly in this, you know, a, an industry really under threat, all businesses are in so, uh, somewhere on the shades of gray of reinvention. But what do you need to divide your time between? And I think in this period of time, it might be that some of it is about learning. You got to be out there reading information. What are other people doing? What are innovative ways of doing events? Um, You know, how do I, what are, so there's a learning because the world is all trying to figure this out, by the way. Mm -hmm. Nobody has the answers. Everybody's figuring it out. So we have this, so there's learning. There might be some kind of designing part of your day where you're, what am I offering that's new? It's like the building new product or service lines or, or supplements to your service lines. Um, so there's that sort of product development that's the designing. Then I think there's selling of some sort and then there's servicing. So that might be like the four, right now in a time of reinvention of your business, there's four zones to your day. What if you built your schedule between nine and five or nine and six or eight and four, whatever your hours are, you built it in two hour blocks and one block is dedicated to learning and another one is to product development and another one is to selling and another one is to servicing. And as you start getting busier, the servicing hopefully gets bigger. Right. And you're doing less learning and now you're really servicing. And so, but right now, maybe start with like four two hour blocks in your day. And now you have a little structure that balances your time between the things you need to do to help your business thrive. And there might be other categories, but that's just an example. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because um, I have a, my live music company. Usually we do tent piece orchestras and ceremony stuff. And, and now because of the virus, I've taken some time to learn. And I, I've actually recreated a completely separate website. We do now for people that have had their trips canceled to Paris, we can create uh, Parisian music. I partnered with a catering company that does, that does all this French uh, food and a decor person uh who debbie lily who does all that and a wonderful catering company so people walk in their backyard and there's france or there's italy or new york or new orleans and uh it's it's really it's really quite quite fun and so i've built the website and it's been really fun to to put that together it's uh uh private uh chicago private concerts and i've learned a lot of skills but i had to set aside time in my day where I was, I'm going to take this time and study how to build a website, how to do some, how would this work with these three other partners and how would we make this, make this possible? Debbie Lilly, you may, you may know her. She does a lot of the big core stuff, but, and then blue plate catering and stuff. And so it's been fascinating working with these other types of uh, people in the industry. Yeah. Uh, but I've had to set aside time to be like, how am I going to learn how to build a website? How do I do marketing with this? And it's been, it's been stimulating and certainly exciting, but it's, it's really been overwhelming. And, and in terms of also keeping my other music company going, yeah. personal life going, and, and it's just a lot to juggle. Yeah. But organizing it like that helps a lot if you, if you can do that. Yeah. Um, but it's a challenge. It's, it's certainly a challenge because when you have, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person, right? 
Yeah, and but creating enough structure that gives each of these parts of your life to, or your business the time, anything we want to achieve, we need time in order to, to do it. You can't have a, 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 a goal and not apply time. What do we have to get to make things happen? We have our time and our focus. So same thing with your personal life. I, I will tell you throughout the entire pandemic, and I worked with, I worked with a lot of people that were, some people were frontline. I worked with the CEO of one of the largest hospital systems in New York City to, you know, people in venture capital, like everywhere. The one thing I said, and for everybody, is you need two personal anchors every day. You need a morning anchor and an end of day anchor that are you time doing something that just restores your body, your soul, your spirit. And it could be like a morning workout or a morning walk and an end of day, you listen to a, a, a relaxing podcast, not a learning one, or you listen to music or you, I don't know, do something, you cook a meal and you're really present because you enjoy that cooking. But everybody, in order to be creative and keep thinking and keep resetting and stepping back, you can't work all the time. You need these anchors every day to ground you. And then no matter what the hell the day throws at you, you're, you, you're coming from a stronger centered place because you've taken care of yourself first and at the end of the day. I cannot emphasize that enough to, as a survival and endurance technique to manage smartly through this changing time. Daily personal anchors. And by the way, they don't need to be long. They can be 10 or 20 minutes. It's not like you need two hours at the end of each day. It's 10 or 20 minutes. That's so true because our society is so based on like, you got to hustle, you got to hustle, you got to like, you know, and the thing is, if you don't recharge your battery on your phone, your phone's going to die and, you know, or like put on the um, oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on the person next to you. Yeah. Because we are have this nature, you and I, with our nationalities, we're, we're very much like, oh, it's, you know, it's fun. We don't take care of ourselves. We want to take care of the world, take care of our employees and stuff. But if we're not taking care of our own selves, yeah. you know, we're going to be less valuable to be able to help people. So yeah. I, I really love that. And it's so true um, that we, that if you really want to help people, make sure you help yourself first too. Yes. For endurance and smartness and you're running a company, it is hard. You're trying to be creative. You're trying to serve clients. You're trying to understand your employees, keep people employed, deal with the finances. You must recharge. Even Fauci, that's very well known. There was an article out about Fauci, our epidemiologist guy. Mm -hmm. And through every single pandemic, epidemic in his whole career, he always took a run at noon every day, no matter what was going on. He took that personal anchor and it always kept him steady and clear headed and he come back from his run and he'd have a solution. We must take that time for ourselves. That, that is, that is amazing. And first of all, uh, Julie, I just want to thank you so much for being, for being a guest. It is such an honor to, to speak with you. You know, I've read your books and I just think you're an amazing person and you're really making the world a better place to live. Oh, so, thank you so much. You, you've made my life much easier. And, uh, I, it is an ongoing struggle to, uh, uh, to, to implement all these things, but I think it's the journey and the path that being aware that, that we have a lot more control over, you know, our, our companies, ourselves, how we live, the quality of our lives and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you contribute to businesses and to, to people. So uh, if any of you have not uh, made yourself as familiar as you'd like with Julie, uh, go to juliemorgenstern.com, and she has a tremendous amount of uh, books, videos, uh, and she's available for hire if you'd like to uh, fly her out, especially in the winter. During, uh, if your temperature is higher than New York, she'll be more than happy to, uh, to work something out for you. But it's truly an honor uh, you know, to, to speak with you, and I just want to personally thank you because I think you're you really made the world a better place to live, more, more organized, definitely, for self. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, it's wonderful to hear from reading the books how much impact they've had on you. Um, and yeah, and I think for everybody listening, 
you just have to recognize you don't have to organize everything at once. And particularly in this time, like just make a list of all the areas of your life that you feel need organizing and then just tackle them one at a time, one at a time. Any small system you create, even if it's your pencil cup, is going to make your life better. It's going to save you time, going to reduce your stress and give you the energy to then tackle the next project. So I think that's the thing I want to leave everybody with is that you can just take it one small project at a time, but make your master list on a whiteboard. And then over the summer, you can slowly check off each area of your business or your home or your time that you want to want to tackle. And we do everything virtually now, by the way. So we don't have to get on planes anymore. We do that's, all our coaching, all of our someday. speeches, all our seminars are virtual. Yeah. That, that's even better. You can, uh, you can uh, speak with anybody anywhere in the world instantly like, like we are. So thanks so much, Julie. I really appreciate it. And to all you listeners, hope you really enjoyed uh, the webinar. Once again, my name is David Rothstein. And I want to thank Julie for being such a, a great guest. Stay healthy, happy, proactive. And now hopefully a little bit more organized. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.